The movie opens with a light swinging back and forth. Robin Media presents... VSDB History Series Main Hall Presenters A series of old school photos Rhonda Jennings Airy Linda Blem Chase Cook Patty Cook Mark Fletcher Chris Bopain Faithlin Robinson Robert Strickler Jr. Hello, welcome to the Virginia School for the Deaf and Blind, VSDB, history series called Main Hall. My name is Faithlin Robinson, class of 1988. I came to this school in 1981 and grew up here. I was also a proud graduate in 1988. I consider this a very special school and I call it my home. I'm standing in front of the oldest building on campus, Main Hall. It's behind me and it is one of the oldest educational buildings in all of America. Main Hall has been through a lot of experiences over the years. It has experienced sadness, joy, perilous times, suffering, struggles, and even war. When you look at the history of VSDB and Main Hall, we want to celebrate together and honor VSDB's birthday. VSDB is 176 years old, so I hope you enjoy the show and learn something new about VSDB. General Assembly Hello, my name is Chris Bo Payne, class of 88. Before VSDB was founded, it all started with the General Assembly. Here is a picture of Richmond, Virginia. Here is an old picture of the Capitol building. The first governor that made a proposal for a school for the deaf was Governor James Pleasance. Here is an old photo of Governor James Pleasance. The idea was to establish a Virginia Deaf and Dumb Asylum under the board of the University of Virginia in or near the town of Charlottesville. Here is an old drawing of the University of Virginia. The bill was postponed due to insufficient information to warrant an establishment of a deaf school. They needed to do more research. The second governor to make a proposal was William B. Giles. Depicted here is an old drawing of Governor William B. Giles. He called upon the General Assembly to establish the School for the Deaf. They needed to get moving. The governor assured that there were many 
deaf, and blind students in Virginia. Here is an old photograph of students. In Virginia, there was more and more people that realized that other states had deaf and dumb schools. Why couldn't Virginia have one? The American School for the Deaf in 1817. The New York Institution of the Deaf and Dumb, 1818. Pennsylvania School for the Deaf in 1820. The Kentucky School for the Deaf in 1823. And the St. Joseph Institute for the Deaf in 1837. Two men led the rally to establish the school. William Plumer. Here is an old portrait of Reverend Plumer and Dr. Lewis Chamberlain. Here's an old portrait of Dr. Chamberlain. Another forceful plea was made to the General Assembly to establish the School for the Deaf, Dumb, and the Blind. Finally, on March 31, 1838, the General Assembly passed an act establishing the Virginia Asylum for the Deaf, Dumb, and the blind. The VSDB became the first school for the deaf and the blind in America. Location. The selection of the site was left to the House of Delegates. In March 1839, they discussed several locations such as Charlottesville, the Valley of Crab Bottom, Stanton, Richmond, Lynchburg, Danville, Lexington, Covington, Williamsburg, Harrisonburg, Luray, Salt Sulphur Springs, and also Winchester. The House of Delegates had much discussion about where the location would be. After three votes, it was narrowed down to either Richmond or Stanton. After further discussion, the House finally selected Stanton by a vote of 65 to 49 votes. Thanks to James Bell, he donated five acres of land to help establish VSDB. Here is an old portrait of Honorable Bell. Depicted here are old photographs of Stanton and East Beverly Street in the 1800s. <laughs> It fades out and shows a picture of Stanton and East Beverly Street today. Board of Visitors Hello, my name is Rhonda Jennings Airy, class of 1984. The Board of Visitors at VSDB was formed on May 6, 1839, the list of members was the Honorable Alexander Hugh Holmes Stewart, the first president of the Board of Visitors, here is an old portrait of Honorable Stewart. Mr. Nicholas Cavill Kenny, the Board of Visitor Secretary. Here is an old portrait of Secretary Kinney. Mr. Robert Gray. Here is an old portrait of Board Member Gray. The Honorable James McDowell. 
Here is an old portrait of board member Honorable McDowell. Reverend William Swan Plumer. Here is an old portrait of Reverend Plumer. Mr. James Points. Here is an old portrait of board member Points. And Dr. Francis T. Stribling. Here is an old portrait of Dr. Stribling. The Board of Visitors met to discuss the appointments of two professors to go ahead and run the school. The first appointment was for the principal or the superintendent for the deaf department, a man by the name of Harvey P. Pete from New York Institution for the Deaf and Dumb. Here is an old portrait of Dr. Pete. The other appointment was William Graham of Philadelphia Institution for the Blind. He was appointed professor of music in the blind department. Here we see an illustration of the Philadelphia Institute for the Blind. The Board of Visitors was thinking about waiting to open the school until the building was completed. However, the President and Directors of the Literary Fund encouraged them to open the school as soon as possible. Upon receiving the information, the Board of Visitors proceeded at once to take the necessary steps to open the school on November 15, 1839. Remember Harvey P. Peet, who had been appointed as superintendent for the Deaf Department? Well, later he declined his position. The Board of Visitors was disappointed and put the search on hold for a replacement. Later, they were able to find a man named Dr. Jean Merillat for the position of superintendent of the blind department. Here is an old portrait of Dr. Merillat. We see a sign sticking from a tree saying, Marriott House, 1851, Virginia Historic Landmark. It pans out to show the house. We are here at the Marillette House across from the superintendent house. Marillette had this house constructed in 1851. It was originally constructed as a four-room cottage. However, it has undergone numerous alterations and additions over the years. The house faces southeast, overlooking the Virginia School for the Deaf and Blind. This illustration depicts the Marillette House overlooking the campus of the Virginia School for the Deaf and Blind. Remember the Board of Visitors appointed Harvey P. Peet as principal or superintendent for the Deaf Department and later he declined this position? Well, the Board of Visitors searched and found the Reverend Joseph Tyler of the Hartford Institution for the Deaf and Dumb in Connecticut. He was the first deaf principal or superintendent for the deaf department. Here is an old portrait of Reverend Tyler. Even though Joseph Tyler was a late deaf adult, still he was deaf. He and Jean Merillat worked wonderfully until the unexpected death of Reverend Joseph Tyler. His death at the early age of 48, after an illness of only two weeks, cast a gloom over the entire town. He was extremely loved by all of his pupils. Here's the tombstone of Reverend Tyler. First Teachers The institution hired its first two teachers, 
one for the blind department, that was William Graham for music, and the other was Job Turner for the deaf department. Here is an old portrait of Reverend Turner. Job Turner came from the Hartford School, or the American School for the Deaf, which was the first deaf school in America. Here's an old photograph of the American School for the Deaf. Job Turner was a very excellent teacher for the deaf. He was also wildly popular. Even though he was short, rotund, and bald, he was mild in his manner and he managed to get himself associated with a quite a number of famous people. It is said he made it a point to call on and shake hands with every president from Polk to Johnson. He also managed to get an interview with President Buchanan. Here's an old portrait of U.S. President Buchanan. Job Turner became sick from Bright's disease, a disease of the kidneys, and passed away peacefully on May 19, 1903. He was a faithful teacher of the deaf for 34 years. He was buried at Thornrow Cemetery, Stanton, Virginia. Here is Reverend Job Turner's tombstone. It reads, for 34 years, a faithful teacher in the Virginia School for the Deaf and the Blind, and sequentially, for 28 years, a missionary to the deaf of the southern states. The stone was erected by friends throughout the South and elsewhere who knew the man well and loved him. Humble Beginnings Hello, my name is Linda Blim, class of 1971. I am here to talk about the history of BSDB. The state of Virginia was very happy to see the Institution for the Deaf and Dumb and the Blind established in 1839. Originally, the plan was to wait until Main Hall was built before they started schooling, but this was advised against, and the institution was opened without delay on November 15, 1839. The school was established on the 15th, and by the 30th, the first deaf girl named Elizabeth Baker was enrolled. Elizabeth Baker from Franklin, Virginia. A boy named Robert Mallory Foley enrolled on December 2, 1839. Robert Foley from Prince William County. It's a few miles from DC. On December 18, 1839, two blind girls were enrolled at the same time, Minerva Woody and Jane Womack. The institution began operation November 15, 1839 with two students in each department in uncomfortable wooden buildings near the Baltimore and Ohio Depot. Here depicts a color illustration of the Ohio and Baltimore train depot. Later, it was realized that it was impossible to educate in a building that was so limited in its means of accommodating and preserving the complete separation of different classes and sexes of the pupils.
the institution rented an additional building and it was located on West Main Street near the bridge. The bridge was there until it vanished in a sinkhole in 1882. Here depicts an illustration of the old building that was a temporary school for students. The deaf pupils occupied their wooden building on the northwest of Augusta and Johnson Street. But it was for a short time. They were moved to a house near the gas works until permanent quarters were completed several years later. Here depicts an illustration of the school finally finished. Admission and Rules Hello, my name is Mark Fletcher, class of 1988. BSDB had an admission procedure for accepting students. As you may or may not know, in order to be admitted into VSDB, parents and students had to go through local educational agencies, otherwise known as LEA. Back in the 1840s, parents of deaf and or blind children only needed to fill out an application and mail it directly to the superintendent. Admission was only for children ages 10 to 18. Here's an old photograph of well-dressed students sitting next to Main Hall. The institution provided each pupil from the state the board, lodging, washing, tuition, books, all other expenses of the schoolroom, and medical assistance at the cost of $130 per year. For out-of-state pupils, the charge was $200 per year. If parents could not afford the charge, pupils were allowed to be admitted free of charge. All traveling expenses for the pupils to or from the institution had to be borne by their friend or parents. Students arrived by train, walking, or by horse. Here's an old picture of a boy sitting in a horse and buggy. Back then, they had rules. Boys were allowed to go downtown while girls were prohibited from going downtown. Boys were allowed to walk around on campus alone. Girls were not allowed to walk around campus alone. They had to go in pairs or quads. Here is an old picture of girls in twos and girls in quads. The only rule that was set up back then and still applies today is that students are not permitted to go back to the residential hall once they go to school. Now, BSDB provides meals three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and supper. Back then, meals were provided four times a day. Breakfast was at 7 a.m., lunch was 10.30 a.m., dinner was 1.30 p.m., and supper was at 6 p.m. Here's an old photograph of girls in the cafeteria. The school hours were different, too. Today, the academic hour is from 8 a.m. to 3.45 p.m. Back then, academic schooling was from 8.30 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. Here's an old photograph of a classroom in Main Hall. 
After 1.30, vocational training began. Working shops for boys, sewing for girls, and the young children worked on the grounds. Here is a series of old class photos. Cobbler making. Sewing for girls. Making mattresses. Print shop. Students did not go to the dorm until after supper at 6 p.m. Robert Carey Long The Board of Visitors was on a roll. They received land donated by the Honorable James Bell. With the school opening on November 15, 1839, the Board of Visitors had a huge task in finding an architect. They found one. His name was Robert Carey Long. Here is an old portrait of Robert Long Jr. The choice of Mr. Long as an architect was a wise one. Long was a famous architect and was well known for his high degree of architectural beauty. the Patapsco Female Institute, Lloyd Street Synagogue, St. Peter the Apostle Church. Robert Carey Long was a junior. His father was Robert Carey Long Sr. He also was an architect and his son followed in his footsteps. We are fortunate to find his original architectural design of Main Hall. Here is a panoramic picture of, blue, of blueprints for the main hall. It has many measurements, lines, and other descriptions for architects to use so they can help build this majestic building. Robert Carey Long designed a great sketch of the basement of main hall. It consisted of a washroom, kitchen, and dining rooms. Here depicts the floor plans of the basement of Main Hall. This drawing indicates where the doors are, where the rooms are located at, the names of the rooms, and the measurements for each of the parameters for architects to use. The next floor up was the first floor. It consisted of boys and girls study rooms, classrooms, parlor, and even the chapel. Here we see the blueprints for the floor plan of the first floor of Main Hall. It indicates the blind wing and the deaf wing. There's rooms such as the chapel, the parlor, girls and boys studies, and so on. Here there's also the indication of where the doors and measurements are for the architects. The next floor up was second floor. It consisted of officers' rooms, teachers' rooms, some classrooms, and even a music room. Here are the blueprints for the second floor of Main Hall. There are many different rooms in this floor. There is a music room, there are some dormitories, there are some chamber rooms as well. Each of these as well has measurements and doorways to help the architects. The next floor up was the third floor. There was no sketch left for this floor, darn it. But we do know that that floor was used for dorms, for girls and boys. Also, after the design was finished, Robert Carey Long moved back to Baltimore, New Jersey, where he was struck ill with cholera. He died at the young age of only 39 years old. This shows the land before the school was made. It then transforms and shows the main hall built. Civil War The institution was doing very well. 
enrollment was expanding from four students in 1839 to 128 students in 1861. Main Hall was full. Then war struck. Military authorities of the Confederate approached Dr. Merillat, the superintendent, and asked if they could use the school as a hospital. Dr. Merillat flatly denied them. He said if the school was closed, where would the students go? Many of them couldn't go home. Here is a solemn portrait of Dr. Merillat. Dr. Merillat told them no. However, unfortunately, the governor demanded that the school be closed and used as a military hospital for the soldiers. Dr. Merillat reluctantly accepted. The students were moved off campus to the Virginia Female Institute, VFI. Now it is called Stuart Hall. Students, teachers, and staff were all relocated. The military came and took over the entire school. Fortunately, it happened during the summer and most of the students had gone home, but 78 students were still left. These students were relocated to the Virginia Female Institute, where they stayed in the main building on that institution. The Virginia Female Institute was not happy with the transfer of students from the institution. The institution tried to pay rent to the Female Institute but they refused to accept. Their argument was that their building was taken without permission and they didn't want to put in their records recognizing VSDB as tenants. With the students moved off campus, Main Hall was being used as a hospital for the soldiers, those that were sick, amputees. First, second, and third floors of Main Hall were used. The basement was used as a morgue, and the chapel was used as an operating room. We see an old painting of Main Hall. The superintendent, Dr. Merillat, considered what to do. With the students off campus at the Virginia Female Institute, he didn't want everything here at VSDB left alone. So he decided to practice his surgical skills here. While helping the soldiers with the need, their needs, he was also able to be on campus, protect the furniture, the documents, and everything on campus. Dr. Merillat stayed on campus, performed surgeries, and helped the soldiers. The money that he received for, as a surgeon, he gave directly to the school to support the school. At that time, the school was rather impoverished. He kept an eye on things on grounds, but he said that many of the grounds and the buildings were being made a mess of. There were military encampments out on the lawn, Behind battle, they had dug a holes for the soldiers to crouch down in. Merillat finally had to give up. Things were being damaged. After everything was over, everything had to be repaired.
Rumors spread that an entire body had been buried somewhere on campus. Well, Mr. Bass decided to check into the matter. He found that it was not true. Instead, the severed limbs of amputees had been thrown out and buried on campus, but not a full body. Dr. Marillat was overwhelmed with the duties of being a surgeon and a superintendent. He decided to resign as superintendent. His brother-in-law, John Collins Covell, took on the position of superintendent. Students were able to be happy and cheerful at the Virginia Female Institute, despite the perilous times. The state of Virginia split into two states due to the war. West Virginia became a Union state and Virginia remained a Confederate state. We see the Virginia state flag and the West Virginia state flag. Finally, in 1865, the Civil War ended. The Confederates surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. An artist rendering of Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse. In the month of May, 1865, the principal was permitted by the United States officer then in command to return to the institution. All of the students came back on campus again. Post-Civil War After the Civil War, the pupils and staff returned to Main Hall. Pencil Drawing of Main Hall After the war, the state of Virginia was so poor that this school had to make their own things to live on. For example, a former graduate of VSDB and historian, Mr. Robert Amon Bass, reminisced several stories from the past. Portrait of Mr. Bass He said, after the Civil War, the state of Virginia was the poorest state in the United States because more battlefields were in Virginia than any other state. After the soldiers surrendered at Appomattox, Soldiers surrendering at Appomattox Courthouse. Most of them walked miles and miles to their homes. Some of them found their homes and farms were destroyed or gone. A soldier coming home finding his house destroyed. At that time, the Virginia School for the Deaf and the Blind at Stanton was very poor. The school had poor food, no heat in the dormitories, and students slept in iron beds which were made in the shops elsewhere. They had no bed springs. The blind students in the school shop made the mattresses. A blind student making mattresses in the shop. They had no chairs in the dining room. They made stools, boxes, and long tables in the school shop for furnishings. They had to use old tables that they found in the basement of Main Hall.
students at the dining hall. During these struggling years, the school went through many different superintendents. Captain McCoy, 1871-1879 Leondez Points, 1879-1880 Captain Doyle, 1880-1882 Dr. Vaughn, 1882-1883 Colonel Roller, 1883-1884 Captain Doyle again, 1884-1896 some of them only served one year. We do not know why, but it is suspected that it was due to political strife during those times. It wasn't until about the late 18 and early 1900s that the school finally improved. Beloved and popular Superintendent Bowles made many changes and improvements. A group photo of Superintendent Bowles with his staff. Just like Superintendent Merillat, he served 23 years. Milan, 1880. Milan, 1880. No other event in the history of deaf education had a greater impact on the lives and education of deaf people. This single event almost destroyed sign language. A photo of a building in Milan. In 1880, there was an International Conference of Deaf Educators, the Second International Congress on Education of the Deaf. At this conference, held September 6th through the 11th, 1880, a declaration was made that oral education was better than manual or sign education, including American Sign Language, or ASL. A resolution was passed banning sign language. The only countries opposed to the ban were the United States, including the Columbia Institute for the Deaf, Edward Minor Gallaudet. A photograph of Edward Minor Gallaudet. Reverend Thomas Gallaudet. Reverend Thomas Gallaudet. Anne Britton. The sign supporters tried, but failed to get their voices heard. McMahon away. Superintendent McMahon away. After McMahon away was selected as the superintendent, after the death of Bowles in 1929, he immediately embraced the philosophy adopted at the Milan Conference. He banned sign language at VSDB. Students suffered for years, and enrollment into Gallaudet College dropped. Separation For many years, the institution discussed the idea of separating the deaf and the blind schools. In 1895, Professor Baer told a national meeting that his 35 years as a professor in the Stanton School convinced him of the utter impossibility of educating the two groups together. Portrait of Professor Baer. In 1896, a bill was introduced in the General Assembly providing for the separation of the school for the blind from that of the deaf. 
The bill failed to become a law at that session. Virginia General Assembly In December 1915, the Board of Visitors declared itself in favor of a complete separation of the school from the deaf from that of the blind and appointed a committee to take the recommendation to the Governor and General Assembly. Governor Stewart Many people, including deaf and blind alumni, students, and staff, rallied together supporting the separation of the schools, even including Helen Keller. A Portrait of Helen Keller On March 21, 1924, the General Assembly approved a bill to establish a school for the blind children of Virginia on a site of 187 acres of land adjoining the University of Virginia in Charlottesville and gave $42,000 for the acquisition of the land. There was great rejoicing by alumni, students, and staff. And then later, apparently for lack of funds, the School for the Blind was never built. Again and again, propositions were proposed for funding to make this a reality, but it failed time and time again until it was totally abandoned. Civil Rights Act Hello, my name is Chase Cook, class of 2003. As you may or may not know, Virginia had two schools for the deaf and the blind. VSDB Hampton was a school for black students. VSDB in Hampton VSDB Stanton was a school for white students. BSDB in Stanton. For 126 years, BSDB Stanton was an all-white school for the deaf and the blind until 1965. John F. Kennedy at a press conference. On June 11, 1963, John F. Kennedy addressed America about the Civil Rights Acts. He wanted schools in America to be desegregated. Panning is a photo of important members of the Civil Rights Movement. VSDB complied with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Superintendent Shimpaw VSDB desegregated in the fall of 1965 and enrolled its first black student. His name is Larry Fortune. He's still alive today and lives in Charlottesville. Larry Fortune. <laughs> President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. Thanks to these men, Martin Luther King, President John F. Kennedy, and President Lyndon B. Johnson, I was able to attend this school. Without them, I wouldn't be here. Cold War Hello, my name is Patty Cook, class of 2002. VSDB Stanton and VSDB Hampton were rivals for many years. Ever since the desegregation, both schools have suffered enrollment. General Assembly
the General Assembly tried to come up with a solution. They came up with the I-95 mandate. The General Assembly required deaf and blind children living east side of I-95 to attend BSTB Hampton and required deaf and blind children living west side of I-95 to attend BSTB Stanton. This was very controversial and caused a rift that has never ended between the sister schools. Education of All Handicapped Children Act, Public Law 94-142. Despite this, the two sister schools continued to lose enrollment. The reason was in 1975, a law was passed that was called the Education for All Handicapped Children Act. That act meant that all deaf, blind, or deaf-blind children could go to mainstream school. Before that, all of these students were required to go to an institution, so that affected enrollment. BSDB went from 435 students in 1975 to about 110 students today. Soon, the General Assembly decided to close one of the sister schools due to the low enrollments. This pushed BSDB Hampton and BSDB Stanton into a Cold War that lasted for 30 years. Both schools fought to remain open, but in 2008, the General Assembly decided to close the BSDB Hampton School. Finally, the Cold War was over. Upper Floors Okay, I'm standing here in Main Hall. The second and third floors of Main Hall were used for years as dorm rooms. Now this building has deteriorated. I'm standing in the room that used to be my bedroom when I was a student here. I remember very well my bed being in that corner right there. There was a bed next to me. I always used to look out the window while Bass Hall was being built, watching them build it. It was very interesting. And my memory of this room is that it was haunted. The reason I thought this was because one night one of the students came running over to my bed and woke me up. This room was full of beds with little girls sleeping. It woke up all of the students. She said, look at that door over there. I said, oh, it's just the wind opening it. But she said, no. All the windows are closed. I looked around, and sure enough, the door was closing on its own. Of course, it frightened us all, and everyone ended up in my bed. I will never forget that scary memory. I couldn't sleep all night. I kept waking up and looking at the door. Can you imagine? I have plenty of good memories of this room. I remember going through that door over on my right to see the kids in the room next to us. There used to be a walkway that led from the dorm rooms to the infirmary. Now everything has changed. I am so happy that they are renovating Main Hall now. Now Bass Hall was opened in 1968 and we all moved to the new building. That left the second and third floors completely empty with only the first floor being used. I was wondering what it will look like or what it's going to look like after it's renovated. Bring it on. Let's see what the next couple years brings for this old building. Okay? Ghosts. Hello. My name is Robert Strickler Jr. Class of 2007. There are many stories being shared about one's experience in Main Hall. One of the stories is about ghosts. 
Yes, there are ghosts in Main Hall. I am standing in Main Hall. If you come in the front door, I am standing on the staircase that is at the end of the hall on the right hand side. This is where I saw my ghost. I was coming up the stairs. Well, let me go back to the beginning. Upon arriving to campus to go to a Halloween party that was in the student center, I found out that I had arrived 30 minutes early. With time to kill, curiosity got the best of me. I decided to go upstairs and have a look around. Now it was night, so it was dark on the staircase. As I arrived at the first landing, I spotted two feet on the staircase above me. Connected to the feet were pants, swaying back and forth. I could see through the pants. Cold chills swept up my arms and the back of my neck. I ran down the stairs and into SLO. In a panic, I told the woman sitting behind the desk what I had just seen. She shook her head and said that she didn't believe me at all. There's a story from a former security person who worked here at BSDB. He was checking the third floor of Main Hall. As he was walking down the hall, he heard footsteps loud and clear behind him. He stopped. He turned to look and there was no one there. He yelled, is anyone here? Who's there? No response. Spooked, he quickly checked the floor and left as quickly as he could. I'm still in the third floor of Main Hall. Back in the day, this room was a dorm room for elementary students. The ceiling is low, which works perfect for elementary kids. There's a window to my right. Back in the day, there was a woman working in security. She was walking across the grounds when she heard screams coming from this room right here. She looked around but quickly ran off. Are you scared yet? The second and third floors have long been closed. But staff have been working on first floor for many years, in SLO and in the administrative offices. They have heard the sounds of noises and footsteps, but they have grown accustomed to those noises. Now when the construction workers come in, are they going to hear the sounds of voices, people walking, and the sound of rattling chains? Cornerstone Mystery In the summer of 1840, the cornerstone on the northeast corner of Main Hall was laid with ceremonies. Very vivid accounts of this event were in the newspapers and Masonic records. Even the Virginia governor, Thomas Gilmer, came. Governor Gilmer The event was for laying the cornerstone. Years later, many people wondered about the exact location of the cornerstone, including Mr. Bass. In the VSDB community, he is a famous person that did so much for VSDB. His name is Mr. Robert Amon Bass. Mr. Bass in his office. He was a 1908 graduate of this school. He wrote the book, The History of the Education of the Deaf in Virginia, in 1949. The front cover of Mr. Bass's book. He was the school's historian, and thanks to him, we have a lot of history that was archived and preserved. Because of him, we are able to have this video telling you the history of VSDB. Mr. Bass did some research and asked several people for any ideas as to the location of the cornerstone. One day a man from the Masonic Lodge said he might have the answer. He came over to locate and pull out one of the stones which they believed to be the cornerstone. A man removing a cornerstone. But they were mistaken. Despite this, Mr. Bass continued to look for it, but the search was fruitless. Today, it remains a mystery. Who will find it next? You? 
main hall today. After many years of suffering, joy, struggles, and even more, Main Hall still stands today. Here we are in 2015. What's happening with Main Hall now? It will go through a two-year renovation. I look forward to coming back here in two years and seeing what Main Hall will look like. Also, will you be here when we celebrate VSDB's 200th year? See you there! Timeless Main Hall A series of photographs and pictures of Main Hall depicted throughout the years 1845, 1850, 1857, 60, 1890, 1900. and ten. Stickler Jr. Interpreters Rachel Effinger, Nick Catalano. Compiled by Faithlin Robinson, class of 19. 